Good day to all IFA members. Um, I think uh, you all know what uh, we are going to talk about uh, today. This is not any mystery. On the 1st of July, the Inclusive Framework has released an historic statement marking an endorsement to the current work on the digitalization uh, of the um, economy. And I'm here, of course, joined by Pascal Saint-Amand uh, from the OECD and also ex officio member of the Permanent Scientific Committee of FIFA, perhaps to chat very informally uh, on this new development, bearing in mind that at the end of November, beginning of December, IFA will be hosting, organizing a virtual event dedicated to, 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 this, uh, to this topic. Um, so the first question I'd like to ask you, uh, Pascal, is... We've seen an unprecedented advancement of this uh, of this uh, project since since the spring, since the G7, and and clearly now with the latest statement of the uh, inclusive framework, we're clearly seeing that the level of detail has very well progressed. And so, in your opinion, what was the triggering factor? How did things move so fast? Yes, thanks, thanks, Robert, and nice joining you. Um, clearly, the impetus was provided by the uh, support by the US and more than support, the fact that President Biden has uh, made this one of his top priorities uh, with all the uh, US firepower, plus the long time support from many countries, France, Germany on the idea of a global minimum tax uh, and uh, leveraging on all the technical work which has been done over the years. I think all the conditions were met uh, to make progress. They were met, but, but they may not have been sufficient. So we had to do a lot of work, last minute work uh, to make sure that uh, we would have, if not consensus, because technically, as you know, consensus means nobody objects and we had nine countries not joining the agreement. Uh, today, it's eight, by the way, since Peru uh, has now joined the agreement. Uh, but, but I think we can be quite uh, happy with the number of countries, more than 90% of the world economy being part of the agreement. Yeah. And, and I mean, if we, if we look at now perhaps more in the details, uh, looking at Pillar 1 and, and, and Pillar 2, coming to first perhaps Pillar 1, we see that the numbers of issues have, have been clarified, I would say even simplified, one of them being actually the scope. Uh, 20 million uh, turnover, Billion. Uh, profitability in excess of, of 10%. What was the, the policy background around this, this decision uh, of scoping these types of companies? Well, the, 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 the scope of Pillar 1 has been the nightmare, uh, or had been the nightmare, until we had the new proposal by the US administration. It had been a nightmare because you had those saying it should be digital, even though the same agreed uh, six years ago that you could not ring fans the digital economy. Um, the US at some point said, uh, let's have all companies. And then they said, but not only when it's linked to marketing intangible, thus this proposal, the unified approach that uh, we did in October 19, trying to reconcile these different views. The US Biden administration uh, did simplify the debate to say, what we need is to address the cases of the winners of globalization, those which have accumulated the rent, and it's the rent which needs to be better shared among countries, thus a purely quantitative approach, which is non-discriminatory, which avoids uh, business line segmentation, uh, and uh, which uh, would ensure that the, the, the tech giants are part of the solution because all of them are there. And I guess their contribution to the overall um, uh, Pillar 1 uh, pot of money is very significant, but no discrimination. So more simplicity or less complexity, if you want, a quantitative, non-discriminatory approach, which still catches uh, the winners of globalization, including digital companies, was, I think, the recipe for getting everybody to agree. Yeah. 
And I understand from the statement that the idea is to start with this company and perhaps depending on the evolution and the success of the whole project, perhaps to lower the thresholds. It's more than perhaps. There will be a lowering of the threshold in seven, seven years following the implementation of the agreement, subject to a proper implementation of the agreement, which, which is quite logical, but it's not perhaps. It's, it's something which has been agreed, which is a concession made up by developed countries to developing countries, because that's a balanced deal. The views of developing countries have been taken into account. This is one of the examples. Yeah, yeah. And basically, quite significant progress, as you said, on, on the simplification. So I guess you anticipate that the, the whole risk of administratability is now manageable. We do think so on Pillar 1 because of the comprehensive scope. The fact that you have a company in its whole, it's either in or out. And if it's in, it's in for all its activities with no business line segmentation. There is only one exceptional case where there could be business line segmentation, but, but it should be really exceptional, which means that you can handle these with a mechanism to enhance and ensure tax certainty, in particular in dispute prevention. So I think the companies in scope actually will have enhanced tax certainty They will have a dispute prevention mechanism and an agreement by a panel of countries in advance to determine what amount A is, how much amount A should go to each country, which should actually be a pretty good deal for the companies in scope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if we go now perhaps to, um, to pillar two, uh, this is also another fascinating topic, but has been much uh, debated. The idea, of course, is to end uh, tax competition. Um, What I want to ask you, the first question I want to ask you is the status of Pillar 2 is a common approach. So basically what will happen is that not all countries are forced, of course, to, to, to adopt the, uh, the Pillar 2 framework. But if they do so, they have to stick to the framework and recognize the approach taken by, by, by the others. There was at some point always the risk that you know, there could be some sort of fragmentation of the whole system that it might lead to a lack of uniformization. How confident are you that that type of problem, which of course is, is detrimental, um, will be avoided with the common approach? Well, precisely because it's a common approach. I mean, you cannot expect a zero tax jurisdiction to introduce corporate income tax. That, not is, that is not the goal of the exercise. The goal of the exercise is to ensure that taxing countries do have a mechanism to protect their tax base. They can do it on a unilateral basis. They can do it without a global agreement. What you're trying to do here is precisely to have a common rule for those willing to do. And there is obviously a critical mass of countries willing to do it. So instead of having 100 different regimes, we will have only one regime, which will be implemented by the relevant countries. And you don't need to bug the zero tax jurisdiction with that. Uh, they're not obliged to implement, but they will be impacted. So you have the impact You limit the diversity of the measures by having a common approach. If a country moves into that direction, this is what it has to do. It cannot do something else, but you don't oblige the countries to do it, while at the same time you have a critical mass of countries willing to do it, which ensures the impact of the measure. So I think it's the, the, the outcome, actually, even though the, the mechanic may sound slightly complex, the outcome is, is pretty good for both tax administrations and tax companies, assuming that the tax policy decision to put in place a minimum tax has been taken, which is the case. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the rates, at least 15%, how is it possible that this might evolve? Or is it, is it a, a, a fixed floor or how does it work? We have a frame agreement uh, on a number of things. This agreement will have to be finalized by October. And we all know, we're not naive, that uh, there is something going on in the US. Uh, and, and, and what happens in the US may have an impact on the rest of the world. So let's wait and see there. That. That's why you have at least 15%. We tend to think that 15% is probably the landing zone. It's, it's, it's a balance, which is already extremely high compared to what people thought could, could happen. Uh, but the at least means it 
could be more, it cannot be below. Uh, and on the carve out, for instance, we have also at least 5% of the carrying value of the assets and the payroll, because it's related to the rate. If the rate of the, uh, the effective tax rate of corporate income tax were to be higher than the one plan, maybe the carve out may slightly move. We'll, we'll have to see. And this is to be decided by October. Yeah, that's exactly my, my last question for you. I mean, the carve-outs. I mean, throughout this, this, this discussion on Pillar 2, we've seen basically that there are two extremes possible. One, of course, is to introduce a minimum tax without any carve-outs. This is presumably not realistic for various reasons, given the interest uh, uh, of certain countries, the incentives of certain countries. And at the extreme, you have, of course, the return to something that could be like BEPS Action 5, uh, patent boxes, substantial activities, and so on. This is equally not going to happen. So I see that we are going to land with probably something, something in the middle. Uh, you mentioned the percentage. I would assume that what is going to be discussed is more the percentage, but the nature of the carve-out or the architecture of the carve-out is not likely to change. The architecture is agreed. Yeah. The architecture is about a percentage of the carrying value of the fixed assets and the payroll, and a percentage which is limited. I mean, 5% of the carrying value of, of the assets is, is limited, but not nil. And the idea is precisely to avoid the downside of the harmful tax practices where you end up validating regimes which, which, which help uh, companies to shelter uh, the rent of intangible property uh, because you have substance. So we, 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 we had the paradoxical situation where, where the BEPS work um, uh, ended up shifting substance to low tax jurisdiction, which was not the goal. So what we're having here is a pretty strict and tough mechanism of a global minimum effective uh, tax rate, 15%. There is one exception, which is that when you have low cost activities or low return activities with real substance measured with people and assets, you may have part of that carved out because we do recognize the need for some countries to have some some tax incentives but but for the for, for for the real substantive activities which do not generate the rent so the carve out is not going to work if you put your patent anywhere it may work if you have a tax incentive to attract a hotel in in a country which is trying to reconstruct after a a civil war i have a concrete example in mind or if you have a factory an automobile factory in a country uh, in eastern europe it may work partly but no more than that which means that it's a very limited carve out but it's a recognition that you need to have some room of maneuver there. But as regards the rent, you will have a better allocation of the rent with pillar one and the safety net at 15% for which the carve out will do nothing or hardly anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a game changer compared to, to BEP section five, huh? clearly, clearly. And, and of course, one last question on implementation. The, the time frame is fairly ambitious, 2023. Uh, do you think this is this is realistic? I mean, coming from a Swiss citizen, uh, the timeline is always interesting. It's a very ambitious timeline. Will we meet it? Shall we meet it? I don't know. We'll see, but we'll do whatever can be done to meet it. Uh, we do recognize it's very ambitious, but I think what matters here is the political message by the finance ministers of the G20, by the leaders of the G20, and more broadly, the 131 countries which have joined the agreement, they say it's now. It's not for in a few years after some further work. It must now be implemented because we have an agreement, a high-level political agreement. We have a frame. This frame will now be finessed and, and, and finalized in October for a very quick implementation afterwards. So that's the goal. Yeah. 
very ambitious. Uh, so, I mean, we're very much looking forward to the development in, uh, in October. And I think that uh, November and December will be the perfect time uh, to, take, uh, to take stock. Uh, Pascal, very, very big thanks on behalf of IFA for sharing uh, thoughts on this. I think this is acting as a teaser. We thought that it would be important to take stock right after the inclusive framework uh, statement. So thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And see you soon. Bye. Merci beaucoup, Pascal. À bientôt. Hein. Avec plaisir. À très bientôt. Bonnes vacances. Au revoir, c'est